today we're wrapping up the I'm Available series, and I have the privilege of sharing on making a difference, and it all comes down to this in a way, uh, as we all know, common sense, that there's a reason why when you got saved, you didn't just spot up to heaven, you know, like beam me up, spot, Scott, Spotty, Scotty, Scotty, thank you. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever actually watched that show or anything, but uh, the saying. Anyways, because there's something for you to accomplish. There's something for us to do. Every single one of us are so valuable and so important to the kingdom of God that your absence is noticeable, that your gifting that God has placed in you and the desires that God has for you and what he created you to do is necessary to the body of Christ. And there is a job to do, and what we say is making a difference. Because truly what we do is when we live our life in relationship with God and we ourselves get whole, we find freedom and we discover who we are. Like when I discovered I'm called to preach, I'm called to pastor, and God is developing that in me, and he will continue to develop that in me. But when I operate in this gift, empowered by the Holy Spirit, I'm actually starting to make a difference. And I get to see the joy and joy seeing Jesus work through me to actually change people's lives. Uh, Marriages transformed, uh, uh, people healed. I mean, we've had amazing, miraculous stories of people being healed. And I just think, man, that is amazing, God. You're so good. And and you see people uh, healed emotionally and and all these different things. It's just awesome to see God work through us. Um, And now what making a difference isn't is, is it's so important to share Because what can happen is we can get so caught up in, I got to make a difference, I got to make a difference, I got to do this, I got to do this, that we get caught up in works, and then we burn out. But making a difference is not something we do to earn brownie points with God. In other words, it's not like, okay, God, I'm going to serve you, and then you do this for me. Nobody's going to put God in debt. You, you can't put it, everything and anything he does or gives, it's all gifts. It's all grace. Even, it's like, you know, some people, and I differ theologically, some people say, God blesses you and obey. I, I get it, but God blesses you anyways. He sent Jesus to the cross. That's the greatest blessing of all when you didn't obey. Obedience is therefore just kind of appropriating what God's freely giving. We're actually graced and empowered to obey. Obedience is a joyous thing that we do as Christians. It's like, Obedience itself is a gift when you, when you get to, to see this. But, but when we begin to make a difference and do things, it's not so that God loves us more. God will never change how much he loves you. How much he loves you now is for eternity, no matter what. You cannot change how much God loves you. You say, how can you prove that? He proved your love, his love for you when he sent his son Jesus to the cross. That is the expression of his eternal love for you. You can't make him give more to you. He's already given everything. When Romans 8 says, if he gave us his son, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So what we're, what we're making a difference is not for something, but rather we're making a difference because of something. Big difference. For instance, David Martin Lloyd-Jones, many years ago, taught on the difference between the gospel and every other religion. And he basically put it this way, every other religion out there, And you can check it. It does. Every other religion out there, they send advisors and counsels. This is how you should live your life. This is how you can live your life in the future. This is something you can do to achieve something, to gain something. For um, when I was in Thailand, the Buddhists believe if they lived a certain way, if they suppressed their feelings, if they suppressed their anger, they would... um, they would uh, come back at something better, you know, karma, things would go well for them. So everything about their life was to gain something and to achieve something. We see that in all the different faiths, whereas the gospel is very different. God didn't send advisors. He sent messengers. How blessed are the peace, are the feet that bring gladdings of good joy uh, and, and tidings of good joy and peace. He sent messengers to tell the world about a historical event that took place and how that historical event changed the universe and can change your life too. It's not to, to achieve something, it's that something has been achieved and now freely given. You see, so now both Religions require response. One, though, is a response of works that I'm going to work to get something, which then leads to burnout or self-righteousness. 
The other response is I'm going to make a difference and I'm going to work not for something, but because of something, because he died for me, because he loved me. They look the same on the outside, but on the inside, they are complete opposites. One is motivated by love. The other one is motivated by selfishness. You see the difference? That the gospel in making a difference, that what we're talking about in serving your community and serving your brothers and sisters and serving at the church and the different things, all of that is geared to doing it from a place of love that because of Jesus, because he loved me, because he saved me, because he transformed me, because he serves me, I'm going to serve. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. Amen? So we're talking about knowing God, finding freedom, discovering purpose, and making difference is not just the vision of the church, but it's the vision that God has for each and every individual. Every one of us are on this journey of continually knowing God more and more, of continually finding greater freedom, continually discovering greater purpose. And as Pastor Tom taught last week about the different seasons and assignments we go through, and then finally today, making a difference. And we're not talking about making a temporary difference. I'm talking about you're making an eternal difference, living a life that really matters. How many of you want to live a life, leave a legacy that in a million years from now, they're still talking about how you obeyed God and how what God did through you on this earth. I don't know about you, but that's me. I don't want to live a life that you forget about in 20 years. Like, who was that guy again? I want, I want Jesus talking about me in a million years from now saying, that Josh obeyed me. That Josh had faith in me. He, he, he didn't give in to fear. He gave in to me. He gave in to faith, and he followed me. I want that. I don't know about you. I want that. So that's what we're talking about, okay? Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is what Jesus talks about mentions about making a difference in the whole purpose and, and the, sum, the, sum, sum, the sum of making a difference. In verse 8, Jesus tells his disciples, but you shall receive power, power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. But notice, it's not just so that I am powered and I have a, a tingly feeling. It's not just so I'm empowered and I feel comfy and cozy inside, you know? That's great. I like it too. But God is empowering you to actually do something. And, and, and you know it too as a human being. Like work is a wonderful thing. You find people that don't have something to do, they don't know who they are. God created us and formed us to, to operate under his anointing, his calling, and with his power to actually accomplish things. In the, in, the, in the garden with Adam and Eve, they were his representatives, his vice regents who had the task of, of replenishing the earth. So God wasn't doing it. God was working with them and through them to do it. And that's what Jesus got back, that for us, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit with an anointing to actually do something, to go make a difference. He says, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The ultimate making a difference. Anything we do from parenting from being a husband and a wife, from being a student, to being an employee, to being a business owner, to being a pastor, to being an evangelist. Whatever it is you do, whatever God's assigned to you, whatever he's purposed you to do, whatever he has gifted you to do, ultimately it all leads to one thing. Testifying that Jesus came out of that grave. All of it, the only thing that matters is not about your name being built up. It's not about our church name being built up. It's not about your business name being built up. All those things are good, and God will do that for you, but ultimately to bring glory to Jesus, that Jesus is glorified, that Jesus is exalted, that he is made famous, because, ladies and gentlemen, he is the center of the universe, and he is the center of your life. He is the one enthroned on your heart. He is the one that this word talks about and is filled from page to page, from line to line. It's about Jesus. It's Jesus. He's the king. He's the Lord. He's the conqueror. He's the hero. He's the one we serve. He's the one we give it all for because he gave it all for us. I'm excited about Jesus, as you can see. I, mean, I love Jesus, man. It's all about Jesus. So I want to live my, I want to pastor in a way that glorifies him. I don't want to pastor in a way that makes me look good. I want you leaving thinking, not, man, Josh, that was awesome. You look great up there with your skinny jeans and the rips in them. No, I want you leaving thinking, man, that Jesus is awesome. 
I want you leaving thinking, man, that Jesus is wonderful. That Jesus is awesome. That's somebody I can serve. That's someone I can lay my life down for. That's someone I can live life fearless for. That's someone I can go to the ends of the earth for. That's someone I could lose my head for. That's someone I will worship. That's someone I'm going to be a good husband for. I'm going to be a good wife for. I'm going to be a good parent for. That's who I'm going to tell my kids about. That's who I'm going to tell my friends about because I can serve that man. I can serve that God. It's about Jesus. And that's what this is all about. And Jesus said, hey, look, I'm giving you my spirit. Whoa, to empower you with real power. This ain't no diamond in a Cracker Jack box kind of thing. This is legit power that created everything that is, that is doing new creation work of restoring and rescuing and repairing lives and creation that even this creation we see will one day be resurrected and the trees will sing and all that God originally intended will be back. And that power, guess where it is right now? It's not in heaven, it's in you. That's where it is. But it remains dormant as long as we're not living to make a difference. And we are not called to make a difference in our own power. You ain't got none. We're not called to make a difference in our own strength. You don't have any. You think you might. You're still prideful. (laughs) We're called to make a difference with the power of God that resides within us. And it's all about glorifying Jesus. So in this message, briefly, I want to talk about two main ways we actually make an eternal difference. Difference. These two qualities, these two things are what actually make a difference, a legacy life that matters. Number one, number one is having a servant heart. Having the heart of a servant. In Acts 26, verse 16 from the NIV translation, it says, now get up and stand on your feet. This is, G- this is Paul talking about what Jesus told him on the road to Damascus when he was converted. He says, I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. Your assignment and purpose may look, your assignment and purpose may look different than Paul. And in other words, Paul was an apostle. He was a church planner. He operated in a lot of different assignments and different seasons of his life. You may not look like that. You may be a teacher. You may be a business owner. You may be in some other field, but guess what? At the, at the foundation of it all, we're all the same, servants. We are called to be servants. We are not called just to be pastors. We are called to serve as a pastor. See, at the heart of what I do is servitude. That's what we're called to do. It looks different, but we're all called servants. Now, this is what this word servant means. Before you get excited, let's hear about this word. It's actually very exciting. But the word servant here in the Greek is literally translated to a ro- under rower. Sorry, I forgot. An under rower. You've seen the movies like uh, 300, The Spartans. Maybe it wasn't in that. I didn't watch that movie. That's rated R. Uh, <laughs> but other movies like back in the day, Ben-Hur and stuff where underneath the deck of the boat, there were the slaves that were chained and they rowed, right? With the beat of the drum, boom, boom, boom. And they're rowing and they're rowing and they're rowing. That's what this word servant means. You are that person chained at the bottom of the boat rowing. Now, he doesn't literally mean you're trained at the bottom of the boat rowing, but what what Jesus is implying is that the life of a servant, what I'm calling you to is a life where you are not seeking praise from other people, you are not seeking praise or glory from this world, but you you can live anonymously in this world towards one purpose, which is moving the boat forward or moving the kingdom forward bringing glory to Jesus. I don't need credit from you. I don't need praise from you. As a servant, a true servant is, I will work and row anonymously as long as the kingdom of God is moving forward. As long as Jesus is being glorified. Listen, if Pastor Tom can say, hey Josh, I I think Jesus is better glorified if you never say another word in public. I'll be like, okay, well, you know, but if if that's really what makes the kingdom better, though that might hurt, I got a servant says, yes. I will do that. I will step down so that the kingdom can go forward. That's what this is about. It's not about my name. It's not about my kingdom. It's not about me. It's about Jesus being glorified and saying, I'm available, God. What do you want me to do? Where is my place? I don't need credit. I don't need the stage. I don't need people to see. I will do the job nobody else wants to do as long as the boat moves forward, as long as I'm playing my part in rowing. Because that, ladies and gentlemen, is where God says, that is somebody important. 
Living anonymously in this world and living without the praise of man in this world doesn't mean you're forgotten or insignificant. Actually, it's the exact opposite. To God, you are the most significant. The way up in the kingdom of God is to go down here. The way to go down into the kingdom of God is to be entitled and to demand praise and credit and, 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 and notoriety from people. God says, no, you're not ready for that yet. I gotta bring you back there. You gotta be humbled. You gotta come lower so that I can take you higher. That's what God says. See, we all know who the greatest man to ever live was, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, God in the flesh, the word made flesh. Jesus, the greatest of all. Nobody will ever upstage Jesus. Nobody will ever take his title. Nobody will go beyond Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, the creator, the one that in him is all things and through him is all things. And he's the creator of everything seen and unseen in heaven and earth. This is Jesus we're talking about. Nobody will upstage him. Why? Is it just because that's who he is? No, Jesus has that position. Jesus has that title. Why? Because he became the greatest servant of all. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life a ransom for all. And you know what? Jesus didn't stop serving when he came up out of that grave. Jesus is continually serving us today. He will never give up on you. He is continuing to work in you. Philippians 1.6 says that the work he started in you, he is not stopping. He is going to keep going. See, you might try to run away from him, but he is not giving up on you. He never regrets picking you. He never regrets finding you. He never gets exhausted of working in you, he will continue to serve and serve and serve. And because he is the greatest servant, he has the greatest title. And he says, come follow me. He says, come serve like me. Come be a servant. Come follow my way. Because he's empowering us to do that. You know, the thing, we, we can't actually properly serve each other and serve the kingdom without knowing two things. Number one, who you are, and number two, what you have. Because if you don't know who you are, and you don't know what you have, you will serve not purely out of love, you will be serving to get something. See, if I don't know who I am, I will serve to find identity, if I don't already have an identity in him. Because then once you take that service capacity out of my life, I've lost my identity. My identity isn't tied to what I do. My identity is tied to my birth in Jesus. And if I don't know what I have, blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, if I don't know that God has freely given me everything that pertains to life and godliness, I will serve to try to get something. See, there's something very interesting. In John chapter 13, verse 3, if you can turn there real quick. John chapter 13, verse Three, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples and they're about to have their Passover meal or they already had their Passover, I'm sorry, they already had, do they already have their Passover meal? <laughs> I get confused with John 13. Uh, it doesn't matter, okay? They're in the upper room, they're having the upper room discourse and Jesus is up there and what's commonplace in that time is they didn't wear shoes. The people there wore sandals or walked barefoot. So it was commonplace that when you walked into someone's home to have dinner, to have a meal, to hang out, which was, uh, fellowship, that was what they did, they went house to house, they hung out, is that the servant or the slave of that house would wash the guest's feet. It's like, you know, thanks for coming in, you don't have to be dirty, let me wash your feet, because it collects all that dust. Well, here they are in the upper room, and nobody had their feet washed, nobody got their feet washed. They, maybe the disciples forgot to set that up, or maybe, you know, Peter was like, it ain't gonna be me, and you know, I'm not doing that, or whatever. So there was a job that hadn't been done. And so here they are, and Jesus, watch this in verse three. Look what the Bible brings out. The Bible is so amazing with how it brings things out for us to see. It says, Jesus, watch this, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. Look at this. Jesus, knowing what he has, everything, and knowing who he is, the son of God, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, about to be the greatest hero of all times. What does he do with that knowledge? Now, first, before we look at what Jesus did, what do you think people in the world do with that knowledge? What do you think billionaires are doing? Do you, what, what kind of things are they doing 
in the world, the, the people in the world, the greatest emperors that ever lived, the, the Napoleons, the Alexanders, the, the greats, and, and these people with power, and they have everything at their beck and call, and they're looked at. What do you think they do? They use that power over people. They use that power and that influence to get what they want from you. I'm powerful. I have money. Do this for me. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. The King of kings. The Lord of lords. The one who could command legions of angels to rescue him, to serve him at all times. The one who could have commanded his own creation to serve him at any beck and call. And we would say, yes, Lord, you're king, you're master, you're creator, whatever you want. He doesn't do that. What does he do? It says, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. The very job nobody wanted to do. The very job that even the slaves and the servants of the day must have hated. Imagine the condition of their feet. Nobody wanted to do it. But the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who owns it all, who has all power and can control everything if he wanted, says, you know what? I'm gonna humble myself even further and do the servant's job that nobody wants to do. I can follow that. I can serve this Jesus because he's gonna always serve me. And he asks us to do the same. The mark of a mature Christian, the mark of a true Christian is servitude. Someone who can serve, someone who's not afraid to do the job that doesn't have glory. Someone who's not afraid to do the job that doesn't get recognized, but does it for him. Does it for his glory. Does it for his name. You might, listen, people may not see you, but God does. And he says, I see that. I see that. I see my son, Josh. I see him doing those things going unrecognized and he's okay. I see him not needing attention and praise from man. That's wonderful. I can't let him stay this low. I gotta build him up. I gotta exalt him. Peter said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Why? So that he can exalt you in due time. He wants those exalted. It says in Philippians 2 that Jesus humbled himself and became a servant. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name and every knee will bow to him. The heart of a servant. Now, real quick, here's four characteristics, real fast, of a servant heart. Number one is a servant puts service over status. They're not, a, a true servant isn't looking for a status or a title or a position. They are just looking to serve. It says in Philippians chapter two, verse three to four, it says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look, no, look out, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. A servant does not care about praise or credit. They don't need their names mentioned or their performance noticed. It's literally all to bring glory to Christ. Number two, a servant puts character over comfort and convenience. They live obedient to God's word even when it's inconvenient. A servant prioritizes integrity and character. That whether it's making me comfortable or uncomfortable or it's convenient or inconvenient, I am going to continue to obey the word of God. You see, if I read the Bible and I agree with everything, there's something wrong with me. I'm not reading the Bible. I gotta let the Bible read me. I gotta read this until I see, oh my gosh, the Bible's making me uncomfortable here because I'm doing this and the Bible's trying to correct me and, and, and get me into a place of more wholeness, more freedom. So I have to say, no, God, that's uncomfortable. That's inconvenient. I don't wanna do that. I say, yes, Lord, I'm available. I wanna be obedient to your word even though it's inconvenient. 
I'm gonna be obedient to your word even though it's uncomfortable. And I'm gonna serve my brothers and sisters. I'm gonna serve the church, not just when it's convenient, but even when it's inconvenient. And Jesus gives us a parable that expresses that perfectly. You've all probably heard the parable about the Good Samaritan about how there was a man who was walking from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was robbed. These robbers came, they took all of his money, they took his clothes, they left him beaten and bruised and bloodied and half dead, the Bible says, on the side of the road. And now what happens is three men walk by. One of them, the first one is a priest. He walks by, he sees the band, he sees the hurting man half dead in the road and decides to keep walking. The second one is the Levite, who's like an assistant to the priest. And these are religious leaders and he sees the man and he decides, I'm not gonna stop, I'm gonna keep walking too. And then there's the hero of the story, the good Samaritan that sees the hurting man, he picks him up, he cleans his wounds with oil and wine, bandages him up, puts him on his donkey, he doesn't say donkey, animal, brings him to the inn, stays with him, helps him out and then pays the keeper even more money to watch over him and make sure he recovers it's a beautiful story and Jesus said be like that Samaritan (laughs) he said love like that Samaritan love serve like that Samaritan served but here's the thing that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. brought out a point that's beautiful he said is that the first two people the priest and the Levite asked the question if I help him what will that cost me see it would be inconvenient we all listen We all have somewhere to be. We all have somewhere to go. I don't know that there's ever been a convenient time for anything. But the Levite and the priest, they're on their way to go somewhere. And they asked the question when they saw the brother in need, and they said, what will it cost me? How will me helping affect me? Whereas the Samaritan didn't ask that. He saw the man and said, How will it affect him if I do nothing? What will happen to him if I keep walking? What about your friends? What about your family? What about people that you see in need? People that don't know Jesus, people that don't know life, people that don't know what you have. What will happen to them if we keep on walking? What will happen to them if we don't share the knowledge of the truth of the love of God with them? Are we asking the wrong questions? Are we asking, yes, it's inconvenient for me. I could tell you story after story of the times when I, back when I was uh, Ubering a lot and the, the customers I would have, and man, I just wanted to get home. I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to share about Jesus, but the spirit, the servitude of Jesus within me would arrest my heart and I would have compassion for that person. I would have compassion for that woman or whoever it was and God would show up in that car. Why? Because I didn't just serve when it was convenient. This isn't about me. This is about I'm entering that making a difference life where I'm not living a life where it's just gonna die. When I die, everything about me dies. But there are people that are out of hell and people going to heaven today because I was inconvenienced and I served anyways. But so often we have to remember, am I asked what question am I, am I asking? How does this affect me? How does this affect me with my finances? That's the big one. I don't want to give. I see they're raising money here. I see they need money here, but how will that affect me? And I'm not saying be stupid with your money, but you should ask the question first, how will it affect them if I don't? How will it affect them if I don't give to the poor? How will it affect them if I don't give these clothes? How will it affect them if I don't tithe to the church? How will it affect the church? How will it affect the kingdom if I don't do this? And that is putting integrity and character, putting service over convenience and comfort. Quickly, number three, is a servant puts we over me. A servant's not looking for Josh or you to be glorified. A servant thinks first about the body. It's not about me being lifted up. It's about the body functioning. It's about us coming together in unity and working to a common goal to make a difference, to glorify Jesus and make a difference in this world. A servant puts we over me. Harry Truman said a quote years ago that I heard that has stayed with me all these years. He said, it is amazing what we can accomplish. No, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. It's amazing what we as a body, this small group right here, what we could accomplish if nobody cared who got the credit. If we, and then let's add biblical onto here. If all of us work just so, Jesus got the credit because he does get all the credit. Number four, a servant puts worship over wealth. 
In Matthew 25, 37, the, it says, Then the righteous will answer to the Lord, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. The heart of a servant, the characteristic of a servant is that I serve you the way I serve Jesus. That when I serve you everything I have, my resources, my energy, my finances, my time, when I use what I have to serve, Jesus says you're serving me. And Jesus, look at the Bible, he remembers all of it. For eternity, he records all all that you do. Even giving a cup of cold water to one of these little ones. Serving. Now the second, and I'm closing in two minutes. The second one, the big one. Number one is having the heart of a servant to make a difference, to glorify Jesus. Number two, and this is the big one, is sharing your faith. Sharing your faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 6, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires, this is God, this is this Lord Jesus who gave it all, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. What is God's desire? What is on his mind all the time? What is it God is after? People. He wants, see, I'm looking out here and there's empty seats. You know, God has someone in mind for that empty seat. It's not to fill a church. It's not to pack a building. It's the people who are being saved and people who are being set free. People who are discovering their creator and what they were created to be and do. And every one of us are here because somebody told us about Jesus. Every single one of us in here, it might have been your mom and dad. It might have been a pastor. It might have been a TV evangelist. It might have been some stranger. It might have been some kid. It might have been a spouse. But somebody opened their mouth and said, I'm going to tell you about the man, the God that changed my life. Every one of us here are because someone made a difference. Someone said, I'm not going to hold this information in. I'm not going to make this a private affair. I'm not going to make this about me. What is sharing your faith? At its essence, it's preaching the gospel. Oh, that's a very churchy word. What does that even mean? Well, when you understand that you right now, every one of us are always preaching all the time. That's what we as humans do, we preach. We proclaim, we declare things. You're preaching about your favorite movie, preaching about your favorite clothes, preaching about this, preaching about that. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. We are always preaching, declaring a message about something all the time. That's what we do as humans, we preach. You girls preach a lot more than guys, okay? <laughs> but we preach and God is saying, the only message that contains the power of God and is life-changing is the message about my son, Jesus. There is power when you tell someone about him being alive. It's not your power. It's not you making something happen. It's the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus, that he is truly alive. And when we share that with somebody by what God has done for me and how he's changed my life, and if you're like me, he has changed my life. My gosh, he has changed me. And when I share that with someone, hey, look, I don't have all the answers, but I do know someone that does. I can point you in the direction of a God that does love you. He knows everything about you, and I don't know all the ins and outs about it, but I can introduce you to him. I can tell you about him. I can 
share the good news about a historical event that a man that said he was Jesus or God, he died. Yeah, a lot of people died. But this guy, he got up out of the grave. He really was. And guess what? He's freely giving everybody salvation. Anybody that believes and calls on him to save, he's there to save. We're only here. This church only exists because somebody opened their mouth and did that. Someone led Pastor Tom to the Lord. Somebody led my granddad to the Lord. Somebody led me to the Lord. Somebody led you to the Lord. Somebody introduced you to Jesus. And the greatest way we can make an eternal difference is by preaching the gospel, sharing the good news about this Jesus that got up out of that grave. Telling people that there is a God that knows everything about you and he loves you. There is a God that is not looking at you in your sin, but he, he, made, he brought his son to the cross to bleed out so that his blood would cover and atone for every sinful deed you've done. And he is not holding it against you. He wants you a home. He wants you to know him. He wants to clean you up. He wants to set you free. He wants to show you why you were created. And he wants to empower you to go do that for others. He doesn't send military advisors. He sends us messengers with joy and peace, sharing amazing news with the world. In Mark chapter 5, there's a guy, you know the story, he was demon-possessed. He was living in the tombs of the countryside, and the and, and, and he would howl at the moon and he would, they, the chains that they would bind him with couldn't be, he was so demon possessed, there's a legion in him that, that he would break the chains and he would cut himself. That's what happens when the devil possesses. He does not give life, he kills and destroys. And he would cut himself. He would try to destroy himself. The devil does that. He wants to destroy people, create such a false self image of who they are. And Jesus conquers a Jesus conquers a storm, gets to the other side of the lake, gets out of the boat, and now there's this naked, demon-possessed dude cut up running after Jesus, running full speed at him. Like I was telling the other church, you don't have to be the fastest one, I just gotta be faster than you, and I'm out of there. I'm getting back in the boat or just running faster than you. Jesus ain't afraid of nobody. And that's amazing because I look at Jesus and say, that's what a life looks like to never be afraid. How much of our life is controlled by fear? Why? It all comes down to sin. We're afraid of dying. We're afraid of falling. We're afraid of what we might look like. And all that fear goes out the door when you have a relationship with God and you know how much he loves you. We ought not give in to fear once. man runs to Jesus that all those demons still couldn't stop him from worship and the man falls at the feet of Jesus Jesus like a G like a boss you know and the man begins to worship what's that that's this man meeting God no God relationship and he begins to worship gives up the idols takes God Jesus and Jesus looks at him and sets him free from all those demons. Tells those demons, get out and don't come back. And those demons run into the herd of pigs and the herd of pigs run into the ocean or the sea. And here's this man set free. Jesus cleaned him. He didn't clean himself. Pastor Tom said the word that came, don't try to clean yourself. Don't try to get your life all fixed up before you say I'm available. He does the cleaning. He does the fixing. He does it. You just say, I'm available. You come to church. You you come, you hear the word. You spend time in prayer to him. You worship him. And he set him free. And now watch this in verse 18 of Mark chapter 5. Verse 18, real quick. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. So here's this man. I'm set free. I have a relationship with you. God, this is what I want to do. This is what I think I'd be good at. This is what I think I should do. And how many of us are like that, right? Like, I think I know my life better than God does. God, I think I'm going to go over here. I'm going to do this over here. I want to do this. I want to be this. I want to do this. And we're afraid of what God might say, of what where he really has planned, because we're afraid. We don't know that the plans he has for you are so much more extravagant and amazing than you could ever dream. And he 
says, no, 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 actually, I have something else for you. Instead of following me, I need you to go make a bigger difference than if you would just follow me and be in this boat with me. I need you to go do something. And he says, however, Jesus, in verse 19, however, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends. He didn't say go start a church. He didn't say go start a ministry. He didn't say go, he he didn't say do something hard. He said, go home to your inner circle. Go home to those that knew you. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Look at what I did for you. I want you to go make a difference. I want you to go tell your friends. Tell your community. Tell those people in your inner circle. Tell them, not some sermon, some hermeneutical, theological, crazy sermon. Don't try to figure out what to say. You just tell them what I did for you. You just tell them how much I loved you. And what I love next is in verse 20. It says, and he departed. And there's not a period there, but rather it's the word and. Don't be one that hears the gospel and departs and there's a period. You'll go to heaven. You'll spend eternity with him. But you have such a greater call than just that. You have something to do. There is some purpose for you to be, be alive today. There is something God has for you, something marvelous and wonderful. It's not that there aren't going to be problems. There's going to be big problems. The devil doesn't want you to do it. But the power of God is in you to sustain you, to give you endurance and patience and to persevere so that you live a life that leaves an eternal legacy. And instead of the period, it says, he departed and began to preach began to proclaim, began to tell in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. You know, Jesus would later visit that area. And later when he visited that area, all the seeds sown by this man that he talked about Jesus, when Jesus got there, they were ready. When Jesus got there, they were ready to receive and there was revival that broke out in that area. Why? because this man made an eternal difference. Because when he departed, he went and opened his mouth. He went, I gotta tell you about Jesus. I remember July 4th, 2005, when I rededicated my life to Jesus and I was at the convention center. I was up way in the back and Kenneth Copeland was speaking. I don't remember what he said, but when he spoke, Jesus sat in that seat with me. I said, Lord, I'm available. I'm gonna follow you all the days of my life. And immediately from there, I went out and I was a valet attendant at the Hilton of Anaheim right there. I told every single person there about Jesus. I drove people crazy. I would just nonstop telling people about Jesus. I would literally valet a car, leave a note in there and say, hey, here, here's five bucks to give the tip to the next valet guy. I would literally give my tip money to the drivers to give those to the other valet attendants. I was just crazy in love with Jesus and I was insane when it was about telling people about Jesus. I've learned a lot more uh, effectiveness in sharing Jesus. But there's just something that when you see his beauty and glory and what he's done, you can't keep silent. And I say that because if we have been silent, I wonder what you've seen about him. Maybe you haven't seen him. Maybe you haven't really met him. Maybe you haven't been lost in his presence and the glory of this king and seen the gospel, the good news of what he has actually accomplished for you and the greatness of our sin and the greatness of his forgiveness. It's life-changing. We can't remain silent. We have to share. We have to tell the world that there is a God that loves them and has power to heal. I just got a text from someone I had met several years ago in an Uber ride. And he texted me, texted me out of the blue. I didn't even know he had my number. Well, I, I guess he did. And said, hey, you, I don't know if you remember me. You Ubered me like two years ago. And he's like, I need to get back into church, man. I feel God pulling on my heart. A seed I sowed two years ago, I had forgotten about. But God never stopped working. You don't know the value and the power of a seed today. 
You could go tell someone about Jesus and they may say, nah, I don't, I don't believe in that stuff. That's okay. That's okay. Why? Because that seed in their heart, God is going to work on it. God is going to draw them. God is going to pull on their heart. God is going to work on them. He doesn't quit. Why? He's the greatest servant. He doesn't stop serving. He's amazing. With every head bowed and eyes closed. I went a little long. I apologize. But if you're watching online or you're in this room today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to give you that opportunity. The Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus did all the hard work. He shed his blood. He endured the penalty for our sins. And he says, my blood is available to cleanse you. And I'm here to make you righteous and to be your righteousness and to be your Lord and Savior. He just asks for you to believe and call out on his name. And it says, all that call on his name, that believe that he died on the cross and rose again, and call on his name shall be saved. And that's the beginning of this journey of knowing God, finding freedom, discovering your purpose, and making a difference. If that's you right now, just from the bottom of your heart, just say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe you died and rose again. I believe your blood cleanses me of unrighteousness, cleansed of sin. And you see me as holy and love me. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, you made that confession. On the screen, there's a a, a number there. It says text new life to the phone number on the screen. We wanna connect with you. We wanna give you a book that talks about the next steps on this journey with God and share with you more about what took place. But I hope you guys enjoyed this series on I'm Available. And I pray that we'll continue to grow in our relationship with God and our worship and that we'll continue to be free, more free today than we were yesterday. Continue to walk and embrace the seasons of change and that we won't remain silent, but we will serve and share the gospel with others. Amen.